chance before we started talking about um, the work that we've done in Wyoming and Colorado and, and expect and hope to do in Puerto Rico. Um, I want to tell a little bit about data and uh, the genesis story of data. So, because I think it's important for the context. So, um, about six months ago, I sat down with, uh, with a lobbyist who I used to work with when I worked, on, uh, worked for Senator Lautenberg years and years ago, um, a fintech lobbyist, and we sort of jocular set, jocularly said to each other, you know, there really isn't one single lobbying, truly lobbying body that is representing uh, digital assets, blockchain, distributed ledger technology that is advocating on behalf of an entire and very large growing sector. And she said, well, I have to tell you, I'd give up my fintech lobbying to sort of help start it. And so away we went. Um, a few months later, and it took a little while for us after Davos to set up a breakfast briefing with the CFTC and the Fed, and it was a quiet breakfast briefing, and we arranged a number of companies who I work with, who Brittany works with, and she'll discuss it, to sit down and have a, a really nice, actually a polite breakfast briefing where we, we were given, for the most part, a, a wink and a nod and a mandate to go forward and form an advocacy group that had a boots on the ground approach uh, to helping regulators understand and figure out this landscape. And so in tandem, um, Wyoming, and, and Brittany will cover it, Wyoming was already in full steam and, and there was some legislation that was about to um, start working its way through uh, legislators' hands and data was formed and we decided to help Wyoming and the Wyoming Blockchain Coalition start to move forward some legislation. So. Go ahead and tell the tandem story. Of course. So we found out in January, actually through um, through a article that Brock shared amongst a couple of groups, that there were two bills that had been introduced to the Wyoming House. Now, I think most people in our community are quite well aware that a lot of governments around the world that are attempting to legislate around blockchain issues and digital assets tend to either over-regulate or put forth legislation that is not really in line with supporting entrepreneurs. I'm not saying that they're doing it to specifically stifle the industry, but because they really don't understand the technology. So as soon as we saw that those bills were introduced to the Wyoming House, it became quite obvious that there was going to be a big need to send people on the ground to Wyoming and start to talk to the legislators, start to explain what is blockchain technology, what are the companies that are active in the space, how is this going to transform industries, how can this be really good for your state government and for the income in your state and the growth of various industries. So we started sending people to Wyoming. Um, I showed up there right after the first two bills had passed through the House. Um, which meant that they go to something called Senate committee. So there's, there's usually um, some of the most senior senators will have a small committee session where they expect um, different stakeholders, either entrepreneurs in the industry or, um, or people from different commissions to stand up and testify either in support or against or questioning uh, different parts of this legislation. Usually this is sometimes when um, amendments are also suggested. So I was one of the people standing up and giving testimony in the Wyoming Senate about why this was so important for the senators. We managed to also get the support of the banking commissioner, which kind of shows you how uh, open-minded and libertarian um, the legislators in Wyoming are. And through all of that support, we managed to pass um, HB 70 and HB 19 through to the Senate. Now, that started um, a couple week process of having to sit down with senators you know, all day long, sit, out, sit inside of the Senate gallery, um, passing them notes saying why we wanted to meet with them and then pulling them outside to have kind of education sessions about what the technology means. And eventually we got uh, five pieces of legislation passed and signed by the president and the governor, uh, which are now um, in full force. So that is, uh, um, <laughs> and we really have Caitlin Long and the Wyoming Blockchain Coalition to really, um, to really credit for that. They, those guys did incredible work, which is now being used as a model, um, not just for other states that we're working on in the US, but all around the world. But actually, Brittany, why don't you take a quick step? Because I think it's important to break down all of those 
pieces of legislation. So there were effectively five bills. Help, I think everyone understand some of them because there's some comprehensive um, language in them that we've we've used and tried to replicate in other states. So. Yeah, of course. Um, so the first two that I was talking about were uh, HB 19 and HB 70. And one of those, which I, I suppose has gotten more uh, press coverage than anything else, defines for the first time a utility token. And that, I suppose the definition of utility token has been one of the biggest reasons why people are afraid of the SEC. Um, it, there's still such a gray area within legislation in our country and all around the world over whether some tokens and some um, blockchain companies can be exempt from securities law. Uh, what is a utility? Um, and starting to describe that to the senators was quite interesting. We got into, you know, airline miles and postage stamps, you know, it's something that you exchange in it for a service. So in that bill, we said that tokens are not by default a, um, a monetary instrument or a security, that they are a new asset class to be defined by new legislation. And as of right now, that asset class is a property. So when we start going further into what that means, I, I want to point out to anybody that, that whether you work in law or not, you know if you really want to protect something in US law, you need to define it as your property. Um, that gives you a lot more control over it and you are assigned a lot more rights. So right now, in the state of Wyoming, tokens are your property and you can domicile that in Wyoming and have that in that state exempt from property tax and exempt from income tax. We also passed an exemption to the Money Transmitters Act, um, which has been, um, which was, actually what kicked off all of this, uh, because of the Money Transmitters Act, uh, Caitlin Long wanted to donate uh, to the University of Wyoming in Bitcoin, and she could not do that, which is why she started to set about to write these laws in the first place. Uh, so the exemption to that act was incredibly important and something where we'll definitely be replicating in other places. Yep, and then I think the other pieces which are, which are critical still, which are the series LLC bill, which you might want to describe, which is the child LLC. Um, so, uh, yeah, sure. I mean, so at, I think as we all know, I mean, we may not all know, Wyoming really had founded you know, they invented the LLC, invented the LLC not in 1977. Delaware. <laughs> um, and so as a result, one of the things that helps to keep this legislation fairly comprehensive is what is a child LLC. So it's the ability for someone to set up essentially in domicile and potentially participate. Again, you could test this, but could a bit potentially participate in the buying of utility tokens effectively by domiciling in the state of Wyoming, right? So the idea is that if you open a Wyoming LLC, not only is it a blind LLC where you can only have your, your lawyer or your agent's name on it, um, but you could effectively own your digital assets domiciling them in Wyoming. And that allows you to have your tokens exempt from the state property tax and income tax. So effectively your LLC could own your wallet. And that's what that idea is about. So I think before we head over to... <laughs> <laughs> I think we have um, Caitlin Long to really thank for this. I really want to make sure that she gets the proper attribution because she's really been she's galvanized a lot of a lot of the support in Wyoming for uh, for the work that we sort of helped to steward. But um, but beyond that, why don't you sort of help to shed some light in terms of what's happened since this past? I know we saw some really great progress in terms of companies that have started to set up. Domicile in Wyoming, um, companies. It's been amazing. Yep. It's been amazing. We've had over 200 um, companies either re domicile or establish themselves in Wyoming since we passed these bills, which is really not so long ago at all. And we've started to see the proliferation of the support for our industry there. Um, the University of Wyoming now has. Um, now has blockchain development courses going on at the university, which is so exciting. We went and um, we went up to Laramie and met some of those students who are so 
involved now in a lot of different blockchain pilot projects. Um, they are really excited about um, some mining experiments that they're setting up. I don't know if anybody knows, but one of the world's uh, largest supercomputers is in Wyoming, so it has the, the cheapest power in, in the country. So there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of growth and development of industry. We also found out on one of our first trips to Wyoming that uh, the government had recently located a, um, a technology budget for tracking and tracing of cattle. So the, the cattle industry is one of the, you know, the, the biggest industries in the state. And they had found that Wyoming cattle, which are apparently more delicious and expensive than some other kinds of cattle, uh, had been falsely sold in other places of the country. Um, so, so beef that had been raised elsewhere and was not as of high quality was being sold as Wyoming beef. So they had allocated a new track and tracing budget, and we found out about that right when we started lobbying um, in the state Senate. And we said, OK, well, I think that is going to be one of the first use cases for us to look at a government budget and propose a blockchain solution. So can we please get a hold of whoever is in control of that budget and ask them to meet with us before they decide who their, who their tech partner is going to be? And luckily, one of our one of our uh, you know most active and founding members, um, Tony Rose, mm -hmm. uh, got involved with that and has actually launched that project. So I don't know if you guys ha have seen, but they they sent cover of Forbes yesterday was Beef Chain. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> So exciting, so exciting, like a beautiful photo of them out tagging cattle, which are, are now being tracked on the blockchain. So I don't think um, people from Wyoming will have um, a fear of their industry being undercut from here forward. <laughs> so, so, so after Wyoming, we, you know, we took it upon ourselves at Data to say, okay, what is what is another appropriate state for us to be working in? And, and we chose Colorado as the next state. Um, and we engaged with a number of lobbyists who are well ensconced in the state and uh, a number of companies that are well ensconced in the state, uh, including Eric Voorhees, who um, helped us and, and testified with us on the floor. So, so two things I'll say, um, because we think that Colorado was a success, although it did not essentially passed. There were some internal issues in terms of how that vote was handled. There was a flip vote at the 11th hour, although it had passed unanimously in the House. Um, on the Senate side, it did not. Um, and so the short version of a very long story is we, we modeled a lot of the legislation from Wyoming in terms of the open, um, open token bill. Um, and in creating uh, an exemption or a tax exemption. Um, for those that will uh, that are working and operating in the state of Colorado, um, and similarly followed very similar model with Wyoming. We we worked with legislators very closely. We engaged the community in Colorado. We had companies that were based in Colorado that were testifying, that were sitting in offices. We drafted that legislation. I mean, the most important piece is that that was our that was legislation we drafted right verbatim, and we were able to sort of put that into their hands. And so I think the the uh, the, the best thing to sort of suggest is that we're setting up a task force um, with the AG, and we expect that we'll be able to pass that legislation in the next cycle. So it's, um, I don't think it's a loss for us. I think it's a success for us that we can be there drafting that legislation, working closely with the community, educating our legislators, um, and saying that we're not going to just hit and run. We're here to stay and support you and support the ecosystem. So. Where are we today? I don't know, Brittany, if you want to talk a little bit about um, where we are data on a, a broader scale, both federally and, and locally, and then I think we can open it up for a few questions. Of course. Uh, so right now we still have the opportunity to propose legislation in a handful of more states this year. Uh, we also have the opportunity to look at doing ballot initiatives in three states, and uh, if we get the right amount of signatures by July to have a referendum on the ballot in November. And now we also are starting to see an interest at the federal level um, to engage and talk about federal legislation. A couple months ago, the White House was saying that they weren't going to look at that anytime soon. But I think everyone in here knows that uh, between the Fed and the <laughs> CFTC and the SEC, no one can really decide um, what this looks like. And state by state, 
it's going to become obvious that um, federal engagement is going to be the most important thing that we can put some of our time towards. Now, we are not just a, an American organization. We are looking to support organizations like Data, like ourselves, all around the world that are starting to pop up to support uh, their governments in legislation or regional governments. Um, I'm going to speak in the European Parliament next Wednesday and I'll be sitting there with plenty of prime ministers, ministers of finance, the head of the European Central Bank to start to talk about what this can look like at a European Union level. We're looking to do the same um, in Asia and also with the African Union and with different United Nations bodies. So right now, um, we are building up our infrastructure. We started just as seven co-founders and um, working with- Eight weeks ago. <laughs> Eight weeks Eight ago. Eight weeks ago. Yeah. Um, and have now been looking at having a permanent infrastructure in DC and uh, looking at building up our subcommittees. So we'll have committees that focus on different regions around the world and committees that focus on specific states so that we have people with, um, with uh, specific interests and maybe companies that are domiciled in those places that can work together to decide what that legislation should look like, write it together, and introduce it and work with the local policymakers to get that passed. So we are very interested in anyone that would like to engage with us. The most important thing is that all of the voices in this industry become a part of this legislation. Because if we don't write this ourselves, people that are not in our industry are going to write it and it's not going to be to our benefit. So now is the time to get on board. You know, it's an all hands on deck type of thing. I don't think there's gonna be anywhere in the world that's not going to look at uh, at least passing some legislation around blockchain and digital assets over the next year. So I think we have a very limited window opportunity for us to have a voice on this. And that's, um, that's probably the most important point I could make, is that it's a limited opportunity window before this legislation gets written without us. And the only thing I'll say in closing is, and I know we've got a, a short time, please don't hesitate to reach out to Brittany or myself. We'll sort of stand over there. Um, you know, obviously, the way that the organization is structured, our bylaws put the power in our working groups, as, as Brittany mentioned. So it means our founding members are very much there and setting the stage in terms of where we are operating, what our strategy is, and, and, and where our next state focus is. Obviously, I, I would not emphasize that we are not going to be in Puerto Rico. We are, we are working very closely with appropriate players in Puerto Rico as well. We have a long-term interest in being there. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Thank you.